Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Russ Jaffe. I am a physician, a biochemist, and a certified clinical nutritionist. I maintain a fellow status in the American Society for Clinical Pathology. So I'm a laboratory medicine specialist. I'm a fellow of the American College of Nutrition. Uh, I'm supposed to know something about nutrition and its biochemistry and physiology. I'm a scientific fellow of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. So I'm supposed to know something about allergies and immunology. I'm a scientific uh, fellow of the uh, Federation of Clinical Immunology Societies. I'm a fellow of the American Medical Laboratory Immunologists. Uh, so I'm interested in clinical immunology in many different aspects. And I'm an overseas fellow of the Royal Society of Medicine. I'm a fellow of the Health Studies Collegium, where we do research and outcome studies and look at their implications for policy and practice. And I am founder and director of ELISA Act Biotechnologies, as well as PERC. Well, fibromyalgia, isn't that an interesting challenge? First, what does the diagnosis mean? When was it defined? How universally is it accepted? So the headlines about fibromyalgia are this. Physiologically, at the physiologic level, there are symptoms of deconditioning of the movement or musculoskeletal sensory systems, <clears throat> a deconditioning uh, that leads to repair deficits and paradoxic increase in malsensation, in painful sensation. That there is physiologically in the fibromyalgia population often, not necessarily always, but most of the time, a physical deconditioning of muscle and joint bone interactions that lead to enhanced sensory pathologies or painful signals. When we look from a pathological or pathology point of view, there is musculoskeletal pain and aching. There's routine disturbed sleep patterns, which means a lack of restorative sleep with many consequences in the neurohormonal, immune, digestive, detoxification, mood, productivity, performance systems. There's a consequence, a consequent fatigue, a fatigue that emerges because of the continuous pain, aching, and disturbed rhythms, often with morning stiffness and local painful tenderness. Clinically, clinically, there are dysfunctions in the neurochemical, immune, and hormonal systems that have recently been identified. Um, and I emphasize that because the term fibromyalgia was coined in 1976 by Hench, so it's relatively recent that it has been identified as a separate syndrome. For many years, it was not widely accepted as a separate syndrome. And I think it was when physicians like Don Goldenberg and other fine rheumatologists developed fibromyalgia themselves or in their loved ones and wrote about those experiences that there was a wider appreciation uh, that the uh, persistent pain, and I'll get back to why it persists, but the persistent pain that characterizes fibromyalgia uh, is real uh, and different than other kinds of pain. Fourteen years after Hensch's uh, coining of the term, the American College of Rheumatology in 1990 uh, did agree on a clinical definition. The reference, the Wolf article uh, that you see on the bottom of the screen, uh, contains that uh, 1990 recommendation of how to make the diagnosis. And we'll now look at that question. Here we have fibromyalgia in terms of its diagnosis. Same reference. There are 18 sites of tenderness. There are 18 places that need to be uh, palpated one way or another with regard to their uh, trigger point painfulness. And the definition is that if more than 11 of 18 sites are painful at a pressure of four kilograms. Now, Experienced pain specialists who know how to do the examination can apply about four kilograms of force or pressure. Uh, some clinicians, an increasing number, use what's called a dolorimeter, a machine that's calibrated to deliver four kilograms 
of pressure to the uh, 18 sites being measured. You see on the right uh, a um, marble statue of the three graces, and superimposed you see yellow dots. Those yellow dots and spots are the 18 sites uh, of tenderness, uh, and uh, it is beyond usual tenderness that must be elicited to make the diagnosis. Uh, as the third bullet points out, tender is not considered painful. Uh, the patient must report painful response to the pressure of four kilograms at 11 or more of the 18 sites. Um, there generally is widespread pain in all four quadrants of the body for a minimum of three months duration. The diagnosis is usually made between the ages of 20 and 50. It does increase in incidence with age. Uh, and by age 80, about 8% of adults meet the ACR classification, what most would consider to be a very strict classification. And there is, if you read the uh, original article, uh, what to do if you have less than 11 tender sites, but many of the other clinical indications. And some would say that's a form frust or a modified version of the syndrome. Uh, I would say it's part of the continuum and qualifies uh, in terms of how one would approach it, especially since our approach will be physiology first before pharmacology. Now, let's look here at what some data says. This is from uh, Macbeth and Mauvais. And they point out that with regard to fibromyalgia at different age uh, spans, um, you can uh, see different expressions in different populations. And 75 to 90 percent of the people who have fibromyalgia are of the female type or persuasion. It does affect about 10 million people in the United States, a not insignificant number. Uh, different studies report 3 to 6 percent on average. Uh, I've seen as few as 2 percent and as high as 10 percent or more in Finland among Finnish women. Um, so perhaps 3 to 6 percent of the population approximately has or qualifies for fibromyalgia. There does seem to be a genetic component, but I uh, have found a much more important epigenetic uh, environmental influence, uh, influences. And now let's look at uh, the percentage of the population uh, that is found to have widespread pain. That's the uh, purple triangles among women. And you see it's about 5% uh, in young adulthood, 18 to 29, it increases to a peak in age 60 to 69 of over 20%. Uh, and if you're over 80, uh, only about 15% of those uh, folks, those women, uh, report widespread pain. Um, if you look below that, you see the green diamond, uh, two lines below. The green diamonds are women with fibromyalgia. Uh, that's a subset of all those women with widespread pain. So fibromyalgia is not the only cause of widespread pain in men and women. You see that the prevalence in this uh, study uh, in the young adult population uh, was about 1.5%, reached a peak of about 6% in the uh, uh, 60 to 79 year old population and declined a bit for those who had uh, lived over 80. Uh, if we look at men, similar but uh, smaller proportions, but similar patterns. Widespread pain in men uh, is about uh, 3% in young adulthood, reaching a peak in the 60 to 69 year old population of about 12.5%. Uh, and among men with fibromyalgia, uh, you see the red squares, the uh, lowest line of this. Uh, it's a tiny fraction of a percent in young adulthood, and it gets up to about 2% uh, by uh, uh, one's uh, full lifespan. So that's what has been found about uh, the uh, age stratification of fibromyalgia and widespread pain. Um, we will mostly be talking about fibromyalgia and some of our successful outcome studies for the rest of the uh, presentation, but do want to mention the importance of other causes of pain, psychological, emotional, and physical, uh, that uh, uh, deserve attention uh, in each from their own perspective and cause. Now, Fibromyalgia is a complex diagnosis with many collateral comorbidities and coincidental conditions. So we're going to look in this slide 
uh, which uh, comes from uh, Dan Claw and uh, colleagues, uh, at the overlap between fibromyalgia uh, and related syndromes, as, as he says. Uh, in his uh, 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 topology, uh, 2 to 4 percent of the population may have fibromyalgia. This is defined by the same widespread pain and tenderness uh, that the American College of Rheumatology recommends. There are regional pain syndromes associated. There's a higher prevalence, or more often you find people with fibromyalgia also have irritable bowel syndrome or painful bladder interstitial cystitis or a TM, I think that's supposed to be TMJ, uh, temporal mandibular uh, joint uh, issues, uh, tension headaches, uh, vulvodynia, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome in about 1% of the population, fatigue and four to eight minor criteria. There is, in our experience also, quite a bit of overlap between fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, there are uh, certain conditions uh, that are considered more to be uh, mental health from major depression, depression, major depression to OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, bipolar disorders, post-traumatic stress disorders, uh, general anxiety disorders and panic attack um, that may be uh, uh, comorbidities uh, and more uh, commonly found in those with fibromyalgia. Uh, these, in our experience, are mostly consequences and results of fibromyalgia, not causes of them. In terms of somatoform disorders, about 4% of the population, multiple unexplained symptoms, no organic findings, and very often no, quote, organic means we can't find the problem patient number ABC. The problem must be yours or in your head. And I, as a laboratory medicine specialist, I will point out that very often we haven't developed a test that's sensitive enough, we haven't developed a test that differentiates and is specific enough or predictive enough. Uh, and so uh, as a clinician, uh, I listen to the patients a lot. Uh, and when the tests don't agree with what the patient says, um, I very often find that the tests have limitations uh, and the patients have experience. Now, with regard to fibromyalgia, there are a whole series of associated conditions with similar symptoms. This is a, another way of looking at the comorbidities, if you will. So with regard to fibromyalgia, something that makes it more likely is mechanical overuse uh, of a particular part of the body, say doing uh, one motion repetitively. Uh, certain medications, particularly statins and fibrates and antimalarials, are associated with induction uh, of or exacerbation of fibromyalgia. Uh, among the endocrinopathies, hypothyroidism, hyperparathyroidism, Cushing's syndrome, uh, hyperadrenalism, diabetes uh, are all associated with uh, an increased, uh, increased risk of fibromyalgia and are more prevalent in fibromyalgia populations. The same is true for multiple sclerosis, myasthenia gravis, uh, malignancies of a variety of kinds, particularly of the bone marrow. Uh, and lymphatics. Uh, infections, Lyme disease and hepatitis C as examples. Uh, rheumatologic diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, systemic lupus erythematosus, SLE, uh, Sjogren syndrome, ankylosing spondylitis, uh, polymyalgia rheumatica. Uh, celiac disease, gluten intolerance uh, with an autoimmune uh, aspect as opposed to just maldigestion. Uh, metabolic myopathy, or what we could call um, an atrophy uh, and enteropathy uh, uh, due to um, consequences of maldigestion and immune dysfunction. Uh, inflammatory myositis, uh, inflammatory muscle disorders like polymyositis and dermatomyositis, and the connective tissue diseases of a wide variety uh, of natures. And osteomalacia, vitamin D functional deficiency, and then regional pain syndrome. Now, most of all of the things I said are autoimmune conditions, and there are exceptions, including the medications and malignancy, uh, <clears throat> and perhaps the uh, vitamin D deficiency, uh, but most of these comorbidities, coincidental conditions more commonly linked together, uh, suggest the immune dysfunction nature of fibromyalgia and the polymorphous nature, the um, uh, wide uh, distribution nature of autoimmune syndromes that often overlap. So when you find any autoimmune or immune dysfunction syndrome, look for others. They're very likely there, and it helps uh, to look at the whole person 
uh, and to restore health and vitality, to reduce risk uh, and enhance uh, health through, for the whole person. Now here we have uh, what I think is a very interesting set of slides, uh, a bit complex, uh, and they are there just to make a simple point. And the simple point I'd like to make about fibromyalgia is that when you do fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, functional MRIs, people with fibromyalgia show differences. You don't have to become a radiologist, and you won't from reading this slide. And if it's a little fuzzy, I apologize. But it does point out that there are real changes in the brains of people with fibromyalgia, the condition is a mind-body, mind-body-spirit condition, but it's not just in someone's head. It is definitely in their brain and body when you look with today's advanced tools and techniques. Now, we mentioned about fibromyalgia and sleep, and this is very important because you know the emphasis we place on restorative sleep and on active meditative uh, practice. Uh, mindfulness practices uh, require a rested uh, and agile mind. So uh, here we see a cycle uh, of sleep disturbance. And if we start from the sleep disturbance box and go to the right and down, we find that, that if you have insufficient deep or uh, non-REM restorative sleep, if you don't have enough deep restorative sleep, then that leads to functional disturbances, fatigue, widespread muscular pain, and tenderness. And now let's look above the sleep disturbance box, and we see three inputs. Localized muscular and joint discomfort, disease or illness, and anxiety or life crisis. What this says to me is that uh, how well we're adapted to the stresses and challenges of our life, uh, how much toxin exposure, uh, how the nutritional quality and wholeness, the freshness, uh, and uh, nutrient density uh, of what we consume uh, is uh, all, uh, each and all, are important. So we want restorative sleep. We want to be resilient in light of the challenges of our day and the stresses of our life. We want to have enough healthy antitoxins uh, to reduce uh, damaging toxins from the environment. We want to reduce our disease risk. 92% is due to lifestyle. And we want to have comfort in our motion, which means a certain amount of stretching uh, and or Pilates type of exercise or Tai Chi or Hatha Yoga or uh, Traeger technique or Feldenkrais functional integration or Alexander technique. Any of the gentler explorations of the limits of sensation not those that are intrusive to force the biomechanics. We recommend those that explore gently and joyfully the limits of sensation and stretch into uh, a more resilient physical biomechanics because of that. Now, what about fibromyalgia itself? Well, it's less likely in people who are physically well conditioned. It is considered by many today to be a disease of deconditioning. And it definitely has to do with muscle-nerve interaction and is a disorder there. In fact, there is an acid from the overly acidic cells, muscle cells, that drips onto the nerve bundle. And a substance P, a pain substance, is produced by the nerve to say to the muscle, stop doing that. But for whatever reason of fibromyalgia, the acid continues to drip and irritate the nerve, the nerve then gets permanently pained, and in addition to being permanently pained, uh, the nerve is refractory to pain medications because pain medications mostly work on the brain. None of the pain medications, none of the tranquilizers work on the nerve muscle uh, interface uh, uh, or the interaction between the nerve and the muscle. So fibromyalgia genuinely is a condition where the pain persists despite pain therapy. And with the association of deconditioning, the approach we have taken, which I'll describe in just a few minutes, is to engage the person within their abilities and build from there, acknowledging and appreciating strengths, recognizing and working with deficiencies or weaknesses. 
Now, let's look for a moment, since I am a pathologist, uh, at the proposed mechanisms of pathology in fibromyalgia. Uh, we see under deconditioning links, mental factors, abnormal sleep, serotonin metabolism, and muscle pathology or trauma. And then there's another set down below, but let's just look at these four. Mental factors are what I'm referencing in regard to how well adapted you are to the stresses of your life. My experience is it's not the external stress, it's the internal adaptation that's important. It's easier to quantify the external amount of stress or force. It's harder to assess the internal equanimity or resilience uh, of the um, personality uh, when challenged. But uh, there are techniques, uh, including those being studied now through the Mind and Life Institute, uh, that uh, allow one uh, to look at how well adapted people are to stress. And we find that many people are de-adapted, that is, they have persisting and negative chemical, physiological consequences of stress, whereas many other people uh, have learned how to turn that around uh, into a highly resilient uh, and realistic yet hopeful uh, experience of life. Similarly, with regard to abnormal sleep, we find that the use of salt and soda baths, a half a cup each of Epsom salts and baking soda, maybe with a few drops of sesame oil to uh, leave the skin uh, uh, moist as well as, uh, as an emollient. We suggest staying in there for 20 minutes. We suggest that it should be warm enough that you come out pink like a baby, not red like a lobster. And while you're in there, we recommend minutes of deep abdominal breathing followed by active meditation. Um, I recommend uh, Dr. Robert Lightman's book, Active Meditation in the Western Tradition by Ariel Press, among others. Notice that deconditioning links also on the right side to serotonin metabolism. Serotonin comes from the amino acid tryptophan, so the amount of tryptophan in your diet and how that tryptophan is handled in the gut nervous system is very important in relation to fibromyalgia. And interestingly, the gut nervous system is not happy in fibromyalgia. Uh, and about 80% of the total serotonin in the body is actually produced in the gut nervous system, not in the central nervous system. So the serotonin metabolism issue in fibromyalgia is probably mostly related to aberrations in uh, digestion, maldigestion, dysbiosis, enteropathy, uh, immune hypersensitivities along the digestive uh, track. And the last is muscle pathology and trauma. Very often the uh, last uh, straw, if you will, the last event before the fibromyalgia onset uh, is a physical or psychological shock or trauma, uh, but it has to be in a hospitable host in order for the fibromyalgia to appear, uh, and that's uh, where the art of medicine uh, comes in. Now on the bottom half of the slide we see immune defense and repair links, and these include endocrinopathy, that is hormonal uh, dysrhythms and imbalances uh, because the immune and endocrine systems are different aspects of a, a total control system of the body. Immune anomalies uh, happen uh, in fibromyalgia. You can find uh, food and chemical delayed allergies if you look for them and we recommend that. And we recommend substituting for any uh, of those immune reactors uh, so that uh, you can enhance the repair competencies of the body. Tissue hypoxia, if the body just doesn't breathe deeply and gets used to having a little bit more carbon dioxide and a little bit less oxygen, uh, that can lead to a condition called tissue hypoxia. Uh, in, and there is a higher prevalence of underventilation or tissue hypoxia uh, in people with fibromyalgia. And the last and uh, important uh, immune defense and repair link is chronic infection. If the immune system is preoccupied with defense work that is reacting to an infection or an invasion of foreign material. If the immune system is preoccupied with defense work, uh, it defers repair. Defense comes first, repair comes after. First we deal with anything that has to be neutralized from the outside. Then we deal with wear and tear and start repairing inside. Well, very often uh, the way in which the body lets you know that it is perpetually or persistently 
doing too much defense and too little repair is through chronic or persisting infections, infections that, re that uh, re you recover from slowly, or even chronic infections like hepatitis and others uh, that can persist for years, uh, slowly uh, being costly to the individual, uh, particularly some organ system. Now, healthy immune responses. You rarely get to hear about healthy immune responses, and they're not very common, but I do want to talk briefly about them. In healthy immune responses, there are no allergies. You are tolerant. We talk about a healthy immune system having tolerance. This means it can neutralize and recycle anything foreign. It can neutralize infections and foreign allergens. It can then get on to repairing us from daily damage. And, most importantly, it's responsible for deleting cancer cells. And since people make cancer cells every day, it's fortunate we have an innate anti-cancer system as part of our immune defense and repair system. So white blood cells recycle pathogens. They break them down to building blocks. They use those building blocks to build themselves up. That's what healthy immune responses are all about. We want to identify healthy immune responses where they exist. We want to restore them where they don't. We want to tell people specifically what's burdening them so that they can substitute, repair, repair their immune defense and repair system, repair their digestive system, and oh, by the way, to repair their detoxification and neurohormonal system. Now, to be a bit technical for just a moment, we're going to look at physiology first, what we call the alkaline way, and what happens when the immune system loses tolerance. When tolerance is lost, people become hospitable hosts, and often those hospitable hosts get an overload of foreign reactive antigens. Infectious and non-infectious are equally foreign to the immune defense and repair system, so it doesn't matter to your immune system whether it's an infectious particle or a food digestive remnant, it's either foreign or not foreign. And the understanding of this, the organization of this intellectually goes back to two very important immunologists, Gell and Coombs, 1963. Type 1, as you see in red, are the immediate acute allergens, allergies. These are the histaminic or histamine amplified reactions. These are the IgE, Ishizaka, Reagan triggered. And these are measurable by conventional skin tests or RAS testing. But then Gell and Coombs pointed out correctly that there are type 2 reactions, humoral delayed allergies, type 3 immune complex reactions, and type 4 direct cell mediated responses, what we would now see as T cell responses. And we felt it important to develop a functional, sensitive, specific, predictive test that measured all three reactions concurrently so that we could personalize care around what people were tolerant to and where they were experiencing foreign invasion. Now, an overloaded immune system means chronic illness. An overloaded immune system means inflammation, which is really repair deficits. An overloaded immune system means more likelihood of pain, uh, the swelling from repair deficits, uh, and many other causes of pain that are associated with an overloaded and under-responsive or resilient uh, immune defense and repair system. An overloaded immune defense and repair system means chronic degenerative autoimmune illness, and there are a series of articles that Townsend Letter for Doctors and Patients has been uh, cordial and gracious enough to publish. Uh, I mentioned uh, one in, uh, on the bottom left of this slide uh, that, you, that can lead you to others uh, online, uh, where we uh, explore the biological aspects of immune defense and repair systems and their clinical relevance uh, to identifying the individual's causes of autoimmune illness, what then to substitute, what then to eat, and what supplements to take, what activities to do, both mental and physical, to restore the immune defense and repair system, the digestive detoxification system, and the neurohormonal systems, all to respective balance, resilience, uh, and overall tolerance. 
Now, the immune system is there to enhance. We want to enhance it. We want to stop the things that burden it. When the immune system is hospitable, the host becomes home to the pathogens it's exposed to. Let me say that a different way. When we get sick, the underlying reason is because we're susceptible. Something in us made us susceptible, and then we got exposed. You do have to get exposed. The germs really exist. But it is not that the germ is aggressive. It's that your body is susceptible. Let me reinforce that. Out of 100 people that get exposed to a virus, bacteria, rickettsia, spirochete, whatever, out of 100 people that get exposed, at most 10 will have any symptoms and one or two will get sick. So very few of the people who get exposed to pathogens actually get sick. The ones who are deficient in essential nutrients, the ones who have excess of persisting toxins, they're much more at risk. And we want to point out that allergens do provoke symptoms in the people who are hypersensitive. That means that repair gets deferred because defense has to be done first. So what's a person to do? Well, we developed the LRA by ELISA Act tests, functional tests, functional tests to identify the causes of immune overload. LRA for lymphocyte response assay. Lymphocytes, specialized white cells that carry the memory. Some of your lymphocytes were, you were born with, others have been programmed to your experiences and exposures. So if we could get lymphocytes into the laboratory and measure their responses to a series of different challenges or antigens or substances, we could have the potential to identify what you are tolerant to, what you can eat, assimilate, and eliminate without immune burden and with benefit, and what are those things that do offend and burden your immune defense and repair system. Now, these are a specialized kind of delayed allergy tests, and there are vital differences among delayed allergy tests. You want your test to be accurate. You want your test to be functional. You want your test to be comprehensive. And you want your test to have proven outcomes. If possible, you want your, your test to give a treatment plan that improves the probability of success. And you get all of that accuracy, functionality, comprehensiveness, proven outcomes, and treatment plans uh, from the LRA by ELISA Act tests. What about the tests themselves? What about these LRA by ELISA Act tests? Well, we win if you want an accurate test. We have less than 3% variance day to day, the best of any test, even though we're also functional. It's a true cell culture. We actually get your living white cells to talk to us under controlled laboratory conditions. It's the most comprehensive test, measuring more pathways with more substances on less blood than any other. And it has proven outcomes. In CBRCTs, community-based randomized controlled trials, the gold standard for people living their lives, comparing a lifestyle intervention to see if they will actually comply and if it matters. And we have treatment plans. Over 50,000 cases in a database, a standardized health appraisal questionnaire to increase the likelihood of successful outcomes. We make all of this available in an accessible, consumer-friendly way. And we're happy to educate both the consumer and the professional community about these important breakthroughs in laboratory uh, testing and functional physiology. Now, these LRA tests are comprehensive and they are functional. And when applied to fibromyalgia or any of the delayed, occult, hard to identify syndromes, they have great value. You see on the left an image, and it's an image of the four different types of immune reactions. Uh, there's a uh, white wedge, which is type 1, the acute IgE or RAST measurable IgE reactions. But then there are the much more common and commonly overlooked until now because of lack of good testing. Types 2 reactive antibodies, which can be of three subtypes. The reactive antibodies can be reactive IgG or reactive IgM or reactive IgA. 
And then there are immune complexes, which are IgM, anti-IgG antigen complex. And then there are type 4 cell-mediated T cell responses. And LRA by ELISA Act, being an autologous ex vivo uh, a culture, measures all of these concurrently, quickly, and accurately. Now, for immediate allergies, the histaminic reactions, we recommend that those, the ones that happen quickly, within seconds to minutes, they are IgE-mediated. A good history or proper RAS tests or intradermal skin tests are the way. And this is what conventional allergy colleagues do, and they only do type 1 measurements and testing. And so if you've had that testing, uh, that's fine, but that doesn't tell you anything about type 2, 3, and 4, the delayed pathways that you can measure through cells, the cells that mediate the reactions. But these are the reactions that occur hours to weeks after exposure. There are three different types of delayed allergies, the type 2 antibodies, the reactive antibodies, but not the neutralizing good antibodies. The type 3 immune complexes, the type 4 T cell responses. There are other kinds of testing, and on the lower right you see the IgG antibody. They're static and I think somewhat confusing because they tell you the presence or absence of an IgG antibody. They don't tell you anything about IgA and IgM. And most importantly, they don't tell you if that's a helpful IgG or a harmful IgG. And they are functional. The lymphocyte response assay that I'm describing, the MELISA assay, which is also a lymphocyte assay, although based on thymidine uh, incorporation, uh, and other lymphocyte mitogen response assays, including colony formation, uh, and a variety of technologies. The delayed allergy tests uh, are uh, subject to some discussion. Uh, IgG, ELISA IgG, EIA IgG, IgG4, I think they're static because they don't tell you whether it's a helpful or harmful antibody. They just tell you it's present or not. I think this is confusing because it doesn't tell you uh, whether it's a helpful or harmful antibody, and it doesn't tell you anything about other classes like IgA and M, or T cell responses, or immune complexes. Now, you can also measure particle size, known as cell sizing, or automatic automated cytotoxic testing. But here, you would assume from the automated cytotoxic testing that is offered, the cell sizing system, uh, that uh, all particles are lymphocytes. You measure a 10 micron particle, and that's the size of a lymphocyte, but that's also the size of platelets when they clump some of the time. And red cells, when they stack together, some of the time have that size. And granulocytes, when they, uh, uh, when they uh, die, uh, their debris often are about 10 microns. So measuring 10 micron particles doesn't tell you about lymphocytes, it tells you about 10 micron particles. We do a true cell culture. We directly observe the lymphocytes and measure their reactivity. It's a lymphocyte response assay, LRA by ELISA Act, validated in multiple outcome studies. Uh, and uh, you see throughout this uh, uh, references that uh, can provide uh, more substantiation and detail. Now, these LRA by ELISA Act tests, the lymphocyte response assays, are ex vivo. That means uh, the patient's own plasma is used to do the incubation. It means that everything is present that is present in the body and the reaction happens just as it does in the body. Uh, the only thing we do in the lab is gently spin the red cells out. Uh, and technically, it turns out the red cells are in the center. They're not at the marginating pool uh, where the lymphocytes interact with the antigens. So lymphocyte response assays are accurate, functional, comprehensive, and of proven clinical outcomes because we get to the causes for each individual and we concurrently measure functionally all delayed allergy pathways. The cells speak, we listen in this ex vivo system. Here you see a technician viewing the cell reactions as they occur in the body. Uh, and this visual contact and observation is needed for accurate results. On the left, you see a non-reactive specimen. On the right, you see a reactive specimen. Uh, that's the difference that the technician actually reads when they see the LRA by ELISA Act tests operationally. LRA by ELISA Act tests are accurate. The lymphocyte response assay by ELISA Act, the advanced cell test procedure, has the best of all cell function tests. Uh, and then 
we um, base the uh, interpretive results uh, on our experience uh, with uh, others. Uh, the average test well has about 50,000 cells in it, less than 0.1% false positives, less than 1% false negatives, less than 3% variance day to day. Um, very good precision for a laboratory test, uh, that especially one based on living cells, but by any measure, less than 3% day-to-day variance, less than 1% false negatives, and less than 0.1% false positives uh, from what we can determine uh, is an excellent profile for a uh, laboratory test. LRA by ELISAC tests are functional. They measure only the reactive harmful antibodies. Uh, they do measure the uh, lymphocytes, B and T cells. Uh, this provides the individual a list of the true causes of immune overload and uh, their uh, subsequent symptoms. Uh, included is a personalized plan, uh, how to substitute where there are hidden uh, possible places of exposure for the substances the individual reacts to, uh, an alkaline way health enhancing diet with targeted supplementation, mental and physical activities to evoke human healing responses. These are all included as part of the interpretation of the test results. LRA by ELISA ACT tests use a simple one ounce 30 cc blood sample. It can now be used uh, to test for over 490 different separate items by this exquisite lymphocyte response assay ex vivo system. Uh, about 240 foods, additives, and preservatives, environmental chemicals, toxic minerals, medications, molds, dander's hair and feathers and herbs, the largest number and the largest variety of substances that can be tested, can be tested by LRA using ELISA ACT methodology. Now there are community-based outcome studies and we've been privileged to do the most successful one. Our hypothesis, our idea for doing the study was that in hospitable hosts and people who were susceptible, chronic foreign reactant exposure would lead to a loss of homeostasis and eventually through multiple steps, FM or fibromyalgia. So our plan was to identify reactive substitution, uh, uh, re identify reactive substances and then substitute for each patient specific reactant, the things that they were reactive to on their LRA tests, leading to, as part of the therapeutic intervention, the diet sup supplements activity, leading to a restoration of homeostasis and enhanced nutritional intervention that then leads to further functionalities, virtuous cycles, and resilience. LRA by ELISA ACT assays are based on whole blood. The 28 cc's uh, are harvested and then transported cold between 4 and 10 degrees centigrade so that the cells go into suspended animation until they're in the laboratory. In the laboratory, we spin gently to remove the red cells, and then the cell or lymphocyte-rich plasma uh, is separated, the term is aliquoted, at 40 microliters per well, incubated at about body temperature, 35 plus or minus 1 degree centigrade, for three hours. And then the technician reads each of those wells, uh, each well representing one of the items being tested for. So the lymphocyte response to antigen stimulation is measured and compared to internal and external controls. And as an example of our quality control, we would be required uh, once or twice a year to include a negative or positive control. We do it with every sample every time. Because if you have pre-reactive cells, then the negative control would be positive, And we would say that the preparation was not adequate uh, and we can't do a good job of reading this specimen. And very rarely this does happen, and we have to ask for a, a repeat sample. Or what if the cells somehow uh, cannot react, which means the positive control will not show reactivity. We do that with every test to make sure uh, how reactive an individual cells are and how they look when they react. And that's an example of the length we go to make sure that we can do a good job and give uh, the best quality of information that we can. Now here is an example from, I believe, the fibromyalgia study. Uh, an unusually high prevalence of reaction to antigens in commercial MSG food flavoring or accent. 
42.5% uh, of this population reacted to that. Candida albicans antigens were reactive in 37.5% of the people. 35% of the people reacted to caffeine and to chocolate cocoa and to food colorings and to cola beverages and to shrimp. Cow dairy products, 25% of the population. Sulfite metabisulfite, 22.5% of the population. Xylene and yogurt, the same, 22.5%. Uh, and one in five of the people reacted to aspartame, BHA, cadmium, lead, sodium benzoate, and oranges. The supplement protocol includes the comprehensive and energized PERC lifeguard family of super multis. It includes the de detoxifying combo phase one, two, and three formula called PERC detoxin guard. It includes high potency flavonoid and flavanol. Uh, products, including PERC Pain Guard and PERC Repair Guard and PERC Way Guard Repair. It includes CoQ10 in rice bran oil, truly mycelized with vitamin Z added for superior functionality and action, uh, the PERC Mitoguard Plus. And then on the lower right, the soluble magnesium alkaline salts, PERC Mag Plus Guard, and the liquid magnesium transport enhancer, PERC Choline Citrate, when taken together. Uh, that also provides a supplemental choline and supplemental citrate uh, to energize and alkalinize the body, uh, as well as to improve brain communication with acetylcholine uh, and uh, cholinergic bile salts and direct choline cellular communication. Now, what were the results of the study? I mentioned that we had a successful study. What was the results of the study? Here we'll look at pain scores, one of the most important things to fibromyalgia sufferers. And if you look at pain scores and you normalize them at the beginning, so everybody's at 100% relatively before. You see three colors, magenta left for control, the middle uh, turquoise for primary fibromyalgia, that is just fibromyalgia, and orange or umbra for secondary or fibromyalgia complicated by chronic fatigue syndrome and other situations. And what you see is at the midpoint of three months, the uh, control population had more pain, the primary fibromyalgia people had about a 50% reduction in pain, and the secondary or complex fibromyalgia had a reduction in pain, but not so much. And if you look out at six months, the far right, you see the controls have even more pain, now twice as much as they started with. The primary fibromyalgia people have less than half, uh, actually less than 40% of their original pain scores, uh, and the secondary fibromyalgia are coming down, but not as fast. What about lack of energy? Again, we normalize before, and then we look at the midpoint or three months, and we find all three groups have less lack of energy or more energy. However, at six months, we find the controls have gone back, and they now have more lack of energy, 120% of where they started, whereas the primary, primary fibromyalgia now has about 55%, so an improvement of 45%. The secondary fibromyalgia has an improvement of about 17%. Uh, what about overall health? We normalized before. At the midpoint, we see that all three show improvement. But by six months, the controls are back where they were in terms of overall health. The primary fibromyalgia uh, are uh, almost uh, twice as healthy relatively as they were. And the secondary fibromyalgia, off a much lower base, has almost tripled their overall health score. So another example of the data saying that this comprehensive approach to both primary and secondary fibromyalgia uh, is effective uh, and in as short as six months. This fibromyalgia physiology first approach is based on a comprehensive plan to reduce immune burden by substituting for reactive items, using high potency nutritional supplements that are safer and more effective, and living well the alkaline way. And we commend to you our monograph, The Joy of Food, The Alkaline Way Guide. It's available digitally and physically. You're welcome to contact us. And I'll be giving the toll-free number as well as email shortly uh, to find out more about The Joy of Food, The Alkaline Way Guide. If I summarize all of what we've said, our immune system can be reset. Our immune system can be renewed. Our immune system can be repaired. Our immune system can have tolerance restored. LRA by ELISA Act tests and treatment guides 
provide comprehensive delayed allergy tests and deliver results. <clears throat> the Alkaline Way to Health includes the Joy of Food, the Alkaline Way Guide, a handbook that makes the plan easy to follow and, um, <clears throat> and enjoyable for many. <clears throat> 